This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, Episode 66. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood, and I'm here with my amazingly beautiful but frozen co-host, Chris Graham. Chris, how <laughs> yeah. you doing, buddy? I'm good. I have thawed. All my joints work now. Yeah. For those who don't know, we just came back from Nam this week. And Chris, just to paint the picture here, Chris, first time flying in like nine years. Mm-hmm. Chris's flight out of Chicago on his way home is canceled due to this crazy vortex. Everyone's probably heard about it. This crazy Arctic vortex thing that came through the north. And it was like negative 20 degrees in Chicago negative 40 or 50 wind chill and Chris's fight was canceled. Chris, what did you do? Tell the audience what you had to do in your scrappiness. I'm glad you asked, but if you're not interested in my story, just know we've got some great stuff for you guys. We're going to talk about Nam, what we learned, what you can learn. It's awesome. But so I haven't flown since my first son was born. He's eight. This was like a little anxiety inducing for me to fly out to Nam. My longest flight I'd ever been on. I used to fly all the time, a long time ago. And so flew out direct to LA on the way back. It connected through Chicago. Almost into Chicago, my cell phone starts getting notifications about canceled flights. I land and the forecast is that it's going to be negative 27 degrees. And now for those of you who are in other countries, negative 27 degrees Fahrenheit is... All you need to know, it's enough to kill you really fast. It's negative 32 degrees Celsius, so it's actually pretty close. Yeah. So like we land, everyone's freaking out. I sprint across... The airport, which is a weird sight, chubby little man like myself. <laughs> chubby tall man. Chubby tall man like myself. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty tall. But anyway, so I get there and there's like a flight that's been delayed that goes to Columbus. This is where I'm from. I like wait for an hour with this sweet girl that's like a brand new employee of American Airlines. And she finally gets me first place on standby. So I'm like, all right, yes, I got it. I'm going to be home tonight. And then they've canceled that flight. We look at the weather and everybody's like, hey, they closed Midway Airport which is like right down the street from O'Hare where I was. So I was like, oh crap, this isn't going to work. I'm going to get trapped here because it's going to be negative 50 degrees windshield. So I rent a car. It's six hours drive. How were all the cars not taken by this point? Because I ran. <laughs> okay. So I like sprinted. I think that most people weren't considering like, hey, no one's going to fly out of here for like three or four days. And I think I was on the leading edge of that. So I run, I get my car. Thank God. And it was the most terrifying drive I've ever done for the first hour and a half. It's like, 25 mile, 30 mile an hour winds blowing 90 degrees across the highway. So I felt like my car was going to get blown off the highway quite a number of times. There's like semi trucks jackknifed. So I pull over and I'm like, I'm just going to take a nap in this rest area for like 10 minutes. Was this after I texted you saying, if you get tired, take a nap. Okay, good. I'm glad I potentially saved your life there with that text. Well, you almost killed me. And let me explain that. So I get in and I'm like, (laughs) "Um, I've got to go pee. And it's like, you know, a blizzard outside and I didn't have my coat because I was like, oh, I'll just be in LA. No big deal. So I'm just like a hoodie. Oh God. So the bathroom's like a hundred yards away. So I get out of my car, I run in the bathroom. And as I open the door, this is two in the morning in the middle of Indiana. I open the door, I walk in and this teeny tiny little hillbilly sprints out of the women's restroom, shaking his hands. And I'm like, oh God. And (laughs) So I like try to ignore what's happening. I go into the restroom and he like waits for me outside and I come back out and he like starts to move towards me and I just got the heck out of there as fast as I could. (laughs) I can't imagine like you're like what? Six, two, six, three. Like I'm like six, two. Yeah. With shoes on. Yeah. 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 You're a tall boy. You're a big boy. And I can't imagine some redneck hillbilly shaking his hands coming out of the women's restroom, literally chasing you across the Arctic tundra that is chicago at this time that's such a hilarious thought in my mind yeah these like truck stops are known to be meetup spots for certain types of people and (laughs) that's a nice way of putting it if you're into that no judgment just this guy seemed like he was going to eat my face for breakfast the next morning that happens in florida for sure but i don't know about chicago i didn't have any trouble staying awake (laughs) for the rest of the night i was like oh god he's a serial killer Ran to my car and just straight shot. It's like the next four hours was totally fine. Just sang Tom Petty at the top of my lungs until I got home. Well, I, for one, I'm glad you made it home safe. I would have been super sad and felt responsible for your death if you would have crashed and died. Well, I appreciate that. Because I talked you into coming to Nam and I feel <laughs> responsible. 
So the topic of today's episode is basically our recap of NAM, but it's so much more than that because there's been dozens of videos on YouTube. There's plenty of shit on the internet about NAM. Our spin on it is what is at NAM for the average home studio owner? What does that mean for the future of home studios? There's a lot in this episode related to how this benefits all of our home studio listeners. And I think we saw some pretty cool stuff, Chris. We did. And not only did we see a lot of cool stuff and got sort of some interesting ideas about where our industry is going, I think some of the best application is talking to you guys about how you can further your career by going to events like NAM. And for those of you guys that don't know what NAM is, it's the National Association of Music Merchandising, and it is hundreds of thousands of people. 115,000 to be specific. 115,000 <laughs> people. <laughs> it feels more like a million because it's yeah. like wall-to-wall people and they're all like music-y. So there's all kinds of people at NAM. And when you're there, it's just a nonstop networking opportunity. It's insane. Here's the deal. Like Chris and I have been meaning to go for all these years. We've been in a summer NAM, which is fine, but I can't even put into words the magnitude that is winter NAM. And it gave us some thoughts on how important getting your ass out into the world and putting boots on the ground is when it comes to networking, furthering your careers, meeting people that you can mutually benefit, people that can benefit you and that you can help benefit as well. And this happened time and time again to both Chris and I and the people in our circle that we were hanging out with, these random occurrences that you would never expect it to happen just presented themselves. These random things happened where two people met that shouldn't have otherwise met. It just was a random occurrence. And we would have never met some of the amazing people we met for this trip and some of which will actually be on the podcast in the future yep. that we would never have otherwise gotten had we not gone to NAM. Random encounters in the hot tub. We're not going to talk about that. It's not as bad as it sounds. Encounters on the floor of NAM at different booths we were talking to people and random people would wander up to us. It would be someone that I've wanted to meet for all these years. And all this was made possible just by buying a $300 flight to NAM and getting our ticket to the event. Yeah, it was incredible. And I think one of the things we talk about on this show a lot, some of the feedback we get from people all the time is like, hey, I live in the middle of nowhere, small town or even big town. And I'm like the only audio engineer I know. I don't have a network. You know, it's like I'm trying to do this. I'm completely alone. You know, feel for you there because I sat in my basement for 10 years mastering songs and clients never came over. It was always over the internet. And because of that, you've developed some very odd habits as a grown man, like yeah. <laughs> just grunting. Chris and I were traveling together, and so he was telling me these noises he makes. He wasn't aware he makes them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not putting you on blast, Chris, but it's just funny to me. It's like, we all do this. Like, I whistle. I like sing to myself because I'm stuck in home all the time, and I have to <laughs> entertain myself. So it's like, we all get these stupid, weird habits because yeah. we're like these cave dwelling creatures. And when you get put out in the world, you start to realize how all these stupid, weird shit that you do with all these habits you've created for yourself are weird. So it's like, you're not by yourself, Chris. I'm in it with you, dude. Yeah. I think I might be a little weirder than you in real life. <laughs> I think I asked you like 10 times if you're okay. <laughs> yeah, you did. Well, I'm one of these people that like, I'll just be like, my, my own business, it's quiet. And then I'm, hmm. <laughs> I'll make it that noise or, you know, not to get into too much detail, but I'm always making mm, noises <laughs> constantly. You'll just sit there and you'll be like, out of nowhere, just, <sighs> I'm just like, a lot of those. Are you okay, man? <laughs> like, and you know, you don't notice them until you're out with other people. So with Nam, what made it so incredible for me, I'm going to try to steer us back towards Nam here. Yeah, yeah. There's a point to this. I promise. Yeah. So at Nam, we talk a lot about having a reality based focused. You know, we talk about that Dr. Henry Cloud quote, integrity is being able to eat reality for breakfast without getting sick. When you're at NAM and you're interacting with hundreds of other audio engineers and companies who sell audio gear and companies who make plugins, you get a really strong dose of reality. You get a really strong sense of, oh, this is what NAM really is. This is what the audio industry really is. This is what audio engineers are really like. And that is a very very good thing for your career. Yes. You start to realize that you're not the only one that makes weird noises. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you see that everyone out there is just like you in some way, shape or form, and you can relate to those people. And honestly, that's healthy for us. As human beings, we are social creatures. There have been studies that say, if you spend all of your life alone, you will die way before people that spend their lives with other people. I don't know what the study is. I'm not going to cite that, but you can look this up somewhere. There's a study about this and whether or not 
it's scientifically backed. I believe it to be true that we are social creatures that are made to be around others. And just the sheer fact that we have gotten out there some and we've spent time around people that are just like us is extremely helpful just for the mental aspect. But there's also so many other benefits to be gained from spending time around people like we did at NAM. Yeah. So my advice, like definitely my take home was I was like, get in on the plane, you know, flew to Chicago, rented a car, almost got my face eaten off, <laughs> got home at five in the morning, drove all through the night, walked in the door and my sentiment was worth it. I'd do it again in an instant. And my other sentiment was this idea of like, why didn't I start doing this right out of college? Got my audio degree. Why didn't I start immediately going to NAM so that I had more of a reality based mentality around what is my industry? And definitely, man, strong advice, you know, for you guys that are locked in basements all day, editing drums and mixing songs and whatnot, go to the conferences. Not just go to conferences, go to local meetups. If there's anything like in Nashville, there's tons of awesome producer meetups and studio meetups and studio warming parties or just like gatherings for audio professionals and music industry people. Your city, if you're a major city, definitely has some. If you're in a smaller city, might have some. But then you have Winter NAM that you should absolutely go to. We'll talk about how you can actually get a ticket to that in a second because it's only for industry people. Two, there's Summer NAM, which is here in Nashville. And if you go to that, I live three blocks from where that's held. So we can all hang out here and drink a lot of coffee and get caffeine highs. Three, there's AES. That's another event that's specifically for audio engineers. And so it's a more concentrated version of hanging around people at NAM, except you just exclude all of those other vendors from the equation. No drummers. That sounds great. Oh, no drummers. Oh, God, please. <laughs> if anyone spent any amount of time in either summer or winter NAM in the drum section, it is actually hell. Don't go to the drum section. Don't do it. Yeah. Let me tell a funny story. So Brian and I walked in and we're like, we're not going to look at a map. We're just going to wander these like thousands of acres of music gear <laughs> and see where we land. And like we walk in yeah. and all of a sudden we find ourselves in this basement and we're the only <laughs> Caucasian people yeah. in this basement. And it's like hundreds of booths of Asian audio manufacturers that are all selling the exact same microphone. It was the knockoff reject basement with like Shenzhen quality audio and like yeah. all of these people you've never heard of before. So we were like, what, where are we? And like Brian's trying to find some coffee and it's just this weird thing. So we like got out of there pretty quick and stumbled into the drum area. And I'll never forget this guy's face, but there's a clearly a drummer walking around with drumsticks. He's that guy. And he's just literally hitting cymbals. <laughs> like cymbal, new cymbal, new cymbal, new cymbal. And there's like, Hundreds of people doing this of like, hey, I'm going to try all the snare drums at NAMM. And if you can imagine like 500 drummers experimenting simultaneously, unsynchronized. Welcome to hell. It was hell. Yeah, welcome to hell. <laughs> Let's bring this in a little bit. And before I forget this, if you are trying to get a ticket to NAMM and you can't, just join AES, join the Audio Engineering Society. Members of that get into NAMM for free, as far as I know. That's how I got into Summer NAMM 2017. So look into that if you're looking to go. We got in as press because of this podcast. So you could also start your own podcast just for the sole intent of getting into NAMM. Yeah. Or you can always get in through a friend. Yeah. If you have a friend who works for, you know, a guitar company or a drum company or an audio company, they typically have extra passes and you can get, you know, like a sponsored pass pretty easily. Yeah. Let's actually get into the meat of some of the things we saw at NAMM because there were some things that are going to, if not disrupt industry now, which I don't think what we saw this year is going to really do a whole lot of disruption right now, but it is going to plant the seed of disruption for the future and potentially eliminate the need for a lot of what we saw there as far as hardware. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about NAM in general, and that you need to understand quick history lesson about our industry, is that back in the day, if you wanted to record records in say 1930, you needed some weird equipment you would probably cut an actual vinyl record live in the studio, like in, uh, uh, what's the movie? Uh, I am a man of constant sorrow. Oh, that's Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah, they would cut the record live. You need a lot of specialized equipment. And as technology has improved, the recording studio has been an easier place to work. You know, eventually they had mixing boards, eventually they had multi-track recorders. And now you can be a 13-year-old in your parents' basement and get a pretty good quality recording accomplished as a teenager. Yeah. There was no potential of that ever happening 50 years ago. Yeah. So the important thing to kind of think about there is that our industry is changing a lot and the things that we take for granted, like preamps, like audio interfaces, 
like XLR cables. There are all these things that we just think like, oh, well, those will always be a thing. Not necessarily. If you look at the history of our industry, at a certain point, people are like, get rid of the tape machine. Are you kidding me? How are you going to record? You, you can't use a computer or a hard disk. That's insane. At one point, recording on a computer was completely nuts. Now it's everybody does it. So NAM is so interesting because you see these new technologies come out. And, you know, we are certainly open to getting sponsors at some point. If the sponsors were compatible with what we preach in this podcast, you're never going to like turn the podcast on and be like, you guys need to buy uh, this preamp because it sounds <laughs> about the same as all the other preamps. And we <laughs> like the knobs on this one. This will help you get more clients. Thank you for saying that preamps, man. Don't get me started. Yeah. So speaking of preamps, we saw a product that we thought was fascinating. And let me just reiterate what you're saying here. We are not sponsored. We are not affiliated. This is just yeah. merely one we came across. <laughs> yeah. We're not sponsored yet. This is just our own, what we saw and how we see it as trusted podcasters who are not being swayed by money is all I'm trying to say. Right. So we're unbiased, at least for the present. So we saw this product and Brian and I have talked at length about whether we should even say who makes it or what it is like, you know, this, we're not really totally sure. So forgive us. I'm going to accept the gear slut alert because technically you have to give it to me as soon as I say the brand. I tried it at NAMM. It sounded amazing. I'd love to try one here in the studio. We're looking into that. It was a USB mic from Antelope Audio. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Cool your jets. Calm down. Aren't USB mics for Twitch streamers and gamers? Yes, it's a $1,500 USB mic with built-in <laughs> mic emulation, preamp emulation, compression, hardware stuff. Basically, it's got the interface incorporated with the mic. It's just, yes. you plug the damn thing in and that's all you need. You don't need a separate interface. You don't need a separate preamp. You don't need any other dongles or gadgets. You plug the thing in on any computer and you're done. Yeah, my jaw hit the ground when I listened to this thing. I was like, that sounds like a really, really good mic. And you can be like, oh, I want it to sound like this mic or that mic or this classic mic. I want to state that the floor was way too noisy and I could not give an opinion on how I thought it sounded because yeah. it was not a good listening environment. So I'm not going to state whether I loved it or hated it. What we did love was what it accomplished and the precedent it is setting for the future of gear for home studios and especially the traveling studio. Yeah, so if you are like doing a lot of solo musicians where it's like 99% vocals, is the only thing you're using a mic for, it brings up this interesting question. Is there a time in the future where there is a top shelf, high quality microphone that's just a USB-C cable that you plug in that powers the mic and then you plug the headphones into the bottom of the mic? I think you use the headphones on your computer. You don't, there's no like headphone in on the actual microphone. There actually is. Oh, there is? Oh, damn, I didn't even see that. So what's so interesting about that is, is there a future when hit records are recorded on USB mics? Here's the thing is like, I don't see that being far away and it sounds ridiculous. Anyone owning a professional studio now with tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of gear are just like rolling their eyes out of the back of their head right now. at even the thought of that, because as gear sluts who want to be validated by our gear collection, that goes completely against everything you've ever believed. But if you look at the reality of like the kid who grew up with Pro Tools or the kid who grew up with a crack Cubase or even FL Studios or something, the kid who grew up with that, I didn't get my first DAW until I was 21. So can you imagine growing up from single digits, always having access to this stuff and where you're going to be at your late teens, Ooh. in your early 20s? And if all you need is a pair of headphones with one microphone and all of your software to create your beats or your loops or the track itself, like if you take the whole band thing out of it, the rock band thing, which is kind of honestly moving away as far as macro trends go. And most of the stuff, if you listen to the Spotify top 50 or top 100 for any country, it's almost all in the box instruments. There's almost no real acoustic instruments involved where you would need an external microphone. If that's the trend of the music industry right now, and I'm not saying it will never come back, the music industry is cyclical. So obviously acoustic instruments will come back in strong form, I'm sure. But as it stands right now, the kid who's grown up with this stuff his entire life, he doesn't have to learn all of this complex stuff that we have had to learn our careers and those before us, all they have to do is plug a microphone in, dial in a tone they're remotely happy with and use their beats and stuff they've created. And of course you have to learn how to use a compressor and plugins and stuff, but they can create a professional, amazing song 
where they're limited not by their technical skills, but they're only limited by their own imagination and their own creativity. And that should be a terrifying thing for anyone with a lot of gear right now. It totally should. And here's the thing that's interesting. Historically, if you owned a studio, you had a moat around you. A moat is a business term that means it keeps competitors from coming to get you. And so you're like, well, I've got the only eight track in New York City. Well, that's a moat. Or Netflix is all the Netflix originals. That's a moat. No other company can license those films from them. So it's hard for Hulu or any of these other guys to compete with Netflix. They have a good moat. So if your thing is like there's you and two or three other audio engineers in your town and you're like, well, you guys should hire me to record you because I'm the only person with this $3,500 mic. Cool-ish. Here's the thing, that $3,500 mic, there are companies that all they do all day, every day is try to figure out how to make a mic that sounds as good as that one for 50 bucks. Go walk around that basement at NAM where all those knockoff Chinese companies are just creating U87 knockoffs for $100. Well, gear sled alert. Oh, you got one. Oh, oh man. Oh, shit. Oh, man. It's been a long time since I've gotten a gear sled alert. Oh, <laughs> man. Well, you know what? I just came back from NAM, so okay. I have an excuse. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. But you see what I'm saying? The point is, like, it's getting easier and easier. Components are getting cheaper and cheaper to get a comparable sound with knockoff gear. But now it's not even about the cheap knockoffs. It's about just the full-on emulation and letting the software do all the dirty work. And that's where it seems to be going. You have Slate. Slate has their mic emulator. And there's only going to be more, is all I'm saying. Yeah, I'd love to do a shootout. If anyone knows Slate and Antelope Audio, we'd love to do a shootout between those two mics and just see whose emulation is better. I will say Chris didn't like Slate's on the floor. But again, I stated... Oh, we're going to be honest. <laughs> I stated that, again, it was an imperfect listening environment yeah. with headphones we were not familiar with. And so I can't say either way whether it was better or worse. Well, and let me headphone nerd for just a moment here. It was tough because you'd go to one booth and be like, oh, let me listen to this mic with this brand of headphones. And then let me go to that booth and listen to a different mic with a different brand of headphones. It was really hard to get, you know, any sort of opinion that was like founded in reality. Plus, there's a ton of background noise. So really like, I'd love to do some shootouts. I'd love to compare. I'm interested. We're both fascinated by the future of the audio industry and this idea that, hey, in the future, if you've got a $3,500 mic, it might not be worth $3,500 or anywhere close to that in the future because you might have some 20-year-old kid 10 years from now that's like, I don't care that your mic was expensive. I bought this mic at Best Buy for 70 bucks, and I can't tell the difference between the two mics. Now, I know you snobs are like, no, that's not a thing. It's not real. But it will be. There are people who all they do all day long is try to figure out how to bring a $3,500 quality mic to the masses at an under $100 price point. We're not there yet, but will we be someday? Well, look at where like guitar amplifier simulation software, like Podfarm, back in Podfarm's days, <laughs> it was trash. And a few guys in the heavy music scene kind of found a way to make it work. But when you look at Amp Sims now, I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Sonny Trulo with STL Tones. He just launched a new plugin and it is amazing what they have accomplished with digital Sims now. 100% in the box, no hardware required like a Kemper. 100% in the box, the way these things sound now is incredible and it's only going to keep getting better. And I see the same thing happening to microphone emulations and knockoffs. I don't know, Brian. I really feel like my Line 6 pod sounds way better than Sony True Love's plugins. Oh, my God. I can't hear that crap. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> yeah, yeah. So now that you can have an idea of just that one thing, just that one mic, that one built in preamp and interface and the power of what that's going to bring, what else do we kind of see as we were walking around, Chris? Okay. So, guys, we saw this thing. There's been some pictures floating around in the Facebook group of us ogling it. <laughs> we were. Wandering around, and we walked by the McDSP booth. And McDSP, I've been using McDSP plugins not so much lately, but there was a chapter in life when I was just like full on McDSP. They've been around since the late 90s, and then they kind of had their heyday with early 2000s. Yeah, so they make some cool stuff. They made, get this, a one space rack mount box full of switches, relays, electrical stuff, and you plug in a Thunderbolt cable, and it's like a transformer. Like Michael Bay Transformer. Not like the literal Transformer, but like a fictional Michael Bay Transformer, like the movie. You would be like, computer, turn into a really nice compressor. And the inside of the box would be like, and it would build an analog compressor 
like I think it was like up to 16 of them or something. Yeah, 16 channel, yeah. Yeah, or you could be like, computer, build a, a VCA style, com- you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, you would tell it to build these things and it would reassemble itself and do all the digital to analog and conversion, run it through the analog parts and then convert it back to digital all through a single firewire cable. And so it was this crazy thing where it was actually a plug-in with physical analog components. It was like, without a doubt, when you talk to people at NAMM and be like, what's the coolest thing you've seen? Everybody would be like, that McDSP thing from hell. It's like the gear sluttiest thing you could ever <laughs> hope to get because it's like this mishmash of plug-in and hardware. It's this marriage we've probably never seen before. Maybe Kemper's the closest thing we've seen to that. And that's probably not even remotely a good example. But this thing's price point, do you remember what they said it was going to cost? Like I think it was like seven or eight grand. Six to eight thousand dollars for this thing. Like that is so far out of the realm for most home studios. And I mean it's fun. Yeah. But like this is what I heard most people say, like, no one asked for this. <laughs> it sounds mean, but like They'll sell some for sure, just for the sheer ridiculousness of it. There's some usefulness to it. I hate to, I asked for it. I fantasize about such a oh box on several occasions. But this is because you are the reigning gear slut champ of this podcast. I do what I can. And I rarely ever get the gear slut alert. <laughs> well, what was funny <laughs> about this box that was cool was like from a philosophical, like, wow, that's impressive. That brings the best of analog and the best of digital and combines it. What was interesting about it, though, is it's small. Yeah, one space rack. So, like, no client is going to walk into your studio and be like, what's that single unit green box in the corner over there? You would think it's like a power supply because there's no meters on it. There's just like a light. It's one button. One button. On. (laughs) It has an on button. And so it's interesting because what it does is really substantial. I'm sure it's fantastic. But... You know, if you buy like some crazy, you know, you know, everyone's seen them like the mastering compressors with a billion knobs and the huge like legal sheet of paper size volume meter doohickey on it. When you buy something like that and a client walks in, there's certainly going to be a whoa moment. There's certainly plenty of Instagram opportunity there, though it's, in my opinion, not the best investment you can make in your business. I think it's a horrible investment as a home studio, and I would not recommend anyone with a home studio buy this thing. The McDSP box? Yeah, there's no way I would ever recommend this to any home studio at that price point. Yeah, I mean, as far as usage for this, it's interesting because it's not like something you can show off to clients unless you like explain what it is because no musician's going to have any idea what this thing is. Yeah, it is such a weird thing because it's a gear slut purchase at that price point without the gear slut allure that most expensive gear has. Yeah, very interesting. I would imagine for like live sound companies that this thing might be a miracle because obviously it's going to have no latency it's analog but to have that much flexibility to be like man we really need this de-esser for this guy all right it, i've constructed it within the box Sounded like a dial-up modem yeah <laughs> so it was interesting but back to our kind of main point with nam is if you want to be successful in business in the recording industry you must have an eye on the future. You must be thinking about what's coming around the corner. And NAM is without a doubt the best place on earth to do that. Do you see this green box morphing into something maybe a little more affordable and usable for the average home studio? Oh, yeah. Or do you see any application for this being shrunk down or changed over to you know something that we would want to use regularly at a more affordable price? Well, yes, I do see this morphing into something else that's more available, that's more accessible. And the reason I see that, there's a really amazing book. I don't think you guys should go out and you know, read it. It's, it's uh, more like straight entrepreneur startup stuff, not so much like immediately useful for home studio owners, but it's called The Innovator's Dilemma. And this was Steve Jobs' favorite book. And The Innovator's Dilemma is that what typically happens, I'm going to like just kind of cut and choose what parts to share here. What happens with technology is people come out with really advanced, really expensive brand new tech. And only the very high end of the market purchases it. And then the company will take that money from the high end customers and they'll reinvest it in order to quote unquote, jump the chasm. The chasm is this idea of taking a very high end product and bringing it down to mass market and selling it to everybody. We see Tesla doing this right now. That's true. That's a good example. They were selling $150,000 roadsters 
to start with. And then it was like, okay, now we're selling $70,000 sedans. And now we're selling $30,000 cars that the general public can afford. So when you see a new piece of tech at NAM, it's interesting from an innovator's dilemma because stuff you have to innovate, but you have to be aware of, even if you look at that piece of gear and say, oh, no, this is useless. This is crazy. Not necessarily. If they can sell you know, a thousand of these units or 10,000 of these units to the very high end of the market, they can take that reinvest into R and D and they might build the next killer product that's available at a much lower price point. It'll be interesting to see first, where does this green box from McDSP end up in the universe? Like what is the type of customer it attracts? Because he was saying that they had people calling up and being like, I don't care what the cost is. I want one as soon as they're available. And so there's always going to be that kind of customer. But then once that gets sorted out, what do they end up doing to cross that chasm if they ever do? Yeah, Nam, guys, it was great. So my advice, I think your take home from this, if we're giving you actionable advice, is if you're a lonely audio engineer trying to make it work in, you know, the middle of nowhere, Michigan or the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, these conferences are a huge opportunity for you to meet like-minded people and for you to also compare notes with them. You know, we, we hung out with some of the URM guys and they were talking about what their businesses look like. For those who don't know, that's Unstoppable Recording Machine. Yeah, these guys are killer guys and amazing entrepreneurs. And just to get a vibe for their energy was like, oh, wow, I didn't know one could have so much energy. Hanging out with Joel Wanasek and just like observing his excitement and vigor for life was like, oh, wow, I need to turn it up a notch. This guy is... Yeah, it's like just being around these sorts of people really encourages you and it kind of shows you your faults. Like yeah. if you have the self-awareness and the ability to look within and say, damn, I could really improve this area of my life because this person has done such a great job of being an exemplary example, if I'm saying that correctly, of what it means to be outgoing or what it means to have energy or what it means to be focused or what it means to be a go-giver. Like there's just every single person we met up with and got to hang out with at this event had some or more than one in most cases quality that I myself needed to start really, really honing in on and working on. And to me, that is one of the most powerful aspects of being around people like this in an event like this is in no other event that I'm aware of are all of the people I've ever wanted to hang out with hanging out all in one place. And you'll randomly meet one of or two of them in one random corner of the room and then randomly meet another one in a restaurant later on and you'll randomly meet another one sitting in a hot tub. You never know what's going to happen. And that's like the exciting part of it. So Chris and I, I say we're going to be at this thing every damn year from now on. Yeah, I agree. I mean, for me, I got to throw this in there because it was really inspiring for me. We were hanging out with Joey Sturgis. Joey Sturgis is part of the Unstoppable Recording Machine. Awesome guy. You know, he was telling his story about, you know, well, first I was like a developer, like he wrote code. And then he was an audio engineer and helped make records. And then he decided to do both at the same time and begin making plugins. And he's on track to retire by 40 because these plugins are selling so well. And it was just like, wow, man, I'm a loser. <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, it was really impressive to like meet guys like that and to pick up, wow, they're really killing it in this area. They've really poured into themselves. They've really developed their own skills in an area. And just, it was sobering, but also inspiring to meet people that were so successful. Yeah. So I think that's a pretty good case of why we've got to all get out of our caves and start being around other human beings. But kind of back to the point of this episode, besides the networking thing, like always having a pulse on the future of the industry, because we've said this many, many times on the podcast, if you don't adapt, you will die. Throughout history, this has been the same for humanity, but now in business in a capitalistic society, it is the exact same. If you do not adapt and change with the times, you will die as a business. So for you to be keeping your finger on the pulse of the industry and keeping up with what is coming and what is changing and what you need to be doing to adapt and ride along with that wave, that again is one of the biggest benefits of coming to an event like this and and staying plugged into the industry because before you know it, some kid with a laptop and this antelope audio USB mic will be wrecking your business and you'll have no idea where he came from if you're not on top of this, adapting and moving along with the times as well. Yeah, so one more kind of take home for me. Brian and I had a conversation with Graham Cochran and this is going to surprise you guys. We talked about marriage. We talked about having strong marriages and the importance of that and that's something 
obviously near and dear to my heart. I'm married. I've got kids. I don't want to be divorced ever. Our industry is strange in that there's a huge number of divorced people in it. And it was interesting because we were talking about marriage counseling. And it was definitely this thing where I'd been thinking about, it's not like my marriage is in the rocks or anything, but what a great investment in my relationship with my wife, marriage counseling could be. And Brian, you know, you had mentioned, you know, you and your fiance going through premarital counseling. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I, we did premarital counseling, but we haven't done anything in, you know, the 12 years since we've been married. And it was inspiring to listen to that. And it reminded me of, we used to go to a small group and the small group was like a bunch of married couples that would get together and talk about being married and their faith and stuff like that. And it was really encouraging because, you know, we were like married about a year or two when we first started going to the small group, which is the small group ended, you know, a decade ago. But it was amazing because we would go to this small group and it was a lot like Nam. We'd go to this small group and we'd be going around the circle and we'd be talking and it would be like, oh yeah, we fight like crazy. And then everybody else would be like, you guys fight too? Oh my gosh, I thought we were, I thought our marriage was going to end because we, oh, it's normal. Oh, okay. And this idea of like talking to other people in real life, hearing about what they struggle with, hearing about what they're working on was inspiring on the one hand to think about your own potential. But it was also encouraging on the other hand to be like, oh, okay, I'm not alone in that weird imposter syndrome struggle where, you know, I believe that I'm maybe just a fake and I'm, you know, been pretending this whole time is we all believe that in the audio industry every once in a while, at least. And so it was really cool being at NAM in the same way that like being in that small group of other married couples was for me and my wife, this idea that, oh, other people have struggles too. And other people's have sweaty feet and BO and <laughs> social issues on the NAM floor. So it was really cool, really cool. So if you haven't gotten out to a conference or a convention or even just a meetup where it's a couple audio engineers grabbing beers and talking about stuff and trying to encourage and edify each other, man, that might be the next step for you and your business. That might be the thing that makes or breaks you. And I know for Brian and I both, you know, we do this mastermind group with a bunch of other podcasters and bloggers like Lid Shaw and Matt Boudreau and Chris Salim and Bjork and Benedictson. And there's a bunch of people, Ian Shepard comes as well. And there are a lot of people where we'll go and talk about our struggles, talk about the things that we're trying to grow in, the things we're trying to learn. And this idea of having a community of like-minded people that you don't see as competitors, but as compatriots is really, really powerful. And I think I would be shocked if maybe five years from now, I meet one of you guys that listens to the podcast and is like, yeah, man, that was a real changing point for me when I started listening to the podcast and I just completely by myself figured it out. That would blow my mind. Most people are going to figure this whole thing out in a community and in the context of a community. And that's a big deal. Having a community of people that can encourage and inspire and console and all these things is, I think, an essential part of building a sustainable career in any field, but especially ours. Whoa. 